Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the church that loves God and loves people. Amen. And not only talks the talk, but walks the walk. Amen. We had a beautiful day yesterday with uh, fellowship and games and some fun and a whole ton of food. That, uh, yeah, I had too much of a problem. But anyway, it was a great time. Um, let's, let's start off with the announcements on the back of the bulletin. With a board meeting on the 4th of September. And the past were like all the deacons, trustees, all the all the leadership team to, to meet. And we'll probably meet in the fellowship hall since we anticipate having more than enough to overwhelm his office. So anyway, we'll meet in the fellowship hall. Uh, table talk on the fifth at noon. For Bible study. And then on the 15th, something very important happened. Uh, Pastor Jordan will celebrate his one year anniversary with us. And there'll be uh, a nice meal following the service. And we hope you can all stay and enjoy it, okay? Uh, table talk again on the 19th of September. And then the assembly outreach on uh, the third Saturday, as usual, where we partner with the Assembly Church and uh, help take care of the, the homeless neighbors that we have in the area and, and anyone else that needs a little help here and there. With and they, they provide a meal, they put, you know, clothing and uh, water, food, whatever, you know, and it's some spiritual guidance as well. So we hope you can join us with that if you'd like to participate. Runs from 11 to 2. So, anyway, and we'll put the banner out in front if I remember. So, okay. uh, then at the end of the month, we have the DWF meeting in uh, the conference in Epworth. And hopefully, some of the folks, some of the ladies are going. I think Rita is the point person on that little uh, journey. So, anyway. I hope we have some ladies to, that will go down and represent us. Yeah. Okay, October uh, is pretty much a carbon copy of September, so you can see what's coming up in the future. I won't go through the book. <coughs> and if you notice, last time you were here, I think that wall was painted. Now uh, the back wall is painted, and probably. <laughs> I say four fifths of the <laughs> other wall is painted thanks to Cliff's efforts, doing an excellent job. Uh, we hope you enjoy the color. It's kind of a sky blue, which is, to me is refreshing and uh, and uplifting. So that's what we want to do in this church. All right. Are there any announcements from the congregation? Yes, ma'am. Uh. We are doing a dinner for the pastor and all of the church after the celebration. Um, I do have some items that we need to try and fill in um, on that menu. Uh, so if anybody is able to see, we'll, um, I'll let you know what the menu is and maybe you guys can go. I know we'll definitely need desserts from the congregation, but if anybody else wants to help fill in some of the other um, things, we actually have a specific menu that is if anybody would like to help Everybody's been a little crazy busy, but we are going to start back to that. So I would encourage all the women in the church. It's a great uh, time to get away. It's a great time for spiritual retreats, um, refreshing and resetting the new year. So if anybody would like to go, um, let us know. We will get you more information. Okay. Uh, maybe for those of you watching us at home or wherever you are in Wi Fi land, uh, Jeanette was just saying that. We need some help with some items for the dinner after the service. Um, 
Jeanette, are, will you stay around a little while to, so the folks can get with you? Okay. Um, also, the uh, ladies' DWF meeting, is the registration is closing when? The 12th. The 12th, okay. Four rooms, the 18th for um, the actual meeting itself. Okay. Oh. There are rooms there that you can get so you don't have to um, <coughs> stay elsewhere. You can stay right here right. at the conference center. We'll be at uh, <coughs> that 45 C. It's a beautiful Christian resort. Um, and we have a great time every time we go. And we learn so much. So, great time for bonding within the, the, the group as well as within the whole region. Okay. All right. Yeah, uh, she just said that there are rooms available at Epworth so you don't have to travel around the town of Savannah or in there, thereabouts. I'm sorry? Same time. Yeah. Same time. I'm sorry. If anybody wants any additional information, they can go to georgiadisciples.org. Okay, georgiadisciples.org. And that's it. Y'all have it. Okay. There'll be a link that says uh, events, and then it'll say women DWF retreat. Okay. If you hit that, it'll tell you all the information about the wounds. Okay. And the, uh, the flyer is on there uh, about the speakers and everything. Okay. GeorgiaDisciples.org. Right. Okay. And the ladies here can see Miss Rita and, and her here. Okay. All right, any other announcements? Yes, ma'am. I wanted everybody to meet my beautiful goddaughter, Acacia. She now lives here, and she's looking forward to becoming a part of this wonderful organization. All right, welcome, Acacia. All right, and uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'll be your elder for the uh, rest of the month. I'm Elder John. Um, been here a while, so probably most of you do know me, but new faces, just want to make sure. All right. So let's go to this morning's worship scripture. Good. All right. So it's first Chronicles, not current, first Chronicles 1634. And it reads Give thanks to the Lord. For he is good. His love endures forever. Now, if you could join me in the call to worship, I'll read the bowl. Or I'll read the. No, you will read the bowl, and I'll read the rest. <laughs> <laughs> My chart. God is our refuge and our strength. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change. Therefore, we are not lost, even though we are not lost. God is our refuge and strength. Glory to God. Amen. Now, if you'd stand and join us in the song of praise, Lord, you are good. Please see the monitor.
pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for this day. For the blessings of your ever-ending presence in our lives. For watching over us. For granting us your peace and mercy. And just, Lord, for all the blessings you bestow upon us. Especially for your son, Jesus. Who in his name we pray all of us. All of our prayers to go through him to you. And Lord, we just thank you for this church. This church that is building on a new frontier to become a living church in this neighborhood. One that reaches all the people in trouble or that need help. Anything we can do to help through the resources you provide us. We just thank you, Lord, for walking with us as we step through the path ahead. And Lord God, thank you for all those people that labor so hard to take care of their families. And in, a, in another respect, take care of this nation to keep the wheels rolling. Lord, I pray that they are enriched and receive the rewards that they so rightly deserve. And Father God, just be with us as we pray for all our men and women out there in uniform, protecting our country and our way of life. And all those first responders that protect us closer to home. Lord, just be with them and their families and watch over them. And now, Father, hear us as we pray the prayer your son taught us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. excited to be in worship with you. So we've come to the point in our service where we lift up what is called joys and concerns. Those moments where we take the things that may have happened during our week that we believe as a church body we need to lift up to God in prayer. I understand that this is the community that we truly do as John said. We love God and we love people and one of the ways to do that is through as a community and as a body of believers we lift things up in prayer. Amen? Amen. So as always, because we have a, a decent amount of people here, it's good to see the faces, good to see all y'all. Um, as you lift your hand, I will address you, and as always, I'll be writing down my phone. So if there's someone that you want to lift up in prayer, say their name and let me know what's going on a little bit. Um, if you just have something good going on in your life, you want to tell the church, say your name and just let us know what's good going on with your name. The only joy and lift of the day is what John had said earlier, that yesterday was a great day for the church. We had a great time eating food, laughing. I beat some of y'all in Jenga. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, but again, like I said, I couldn't play out Monopoly because I wanted y'all to come to church today. So I thank you for coming to church. And this is, it's called mercy. It's called the mercy from God. But we had a great time yesterday. I'm excited for us to continue to do things like that because we understand that we must not only worship, but we must also fellowship. Both parts are key to a community of believers coming together and truly being a part of God's family. So that's the joy that I lift up, and you know, I pray and I thank God for that. So what are the joys and concerns that we have in the house today? And those, of course, who are online, please put them in the comments, and we will be reading them and adding them to the list a little bit later. Any joys and concerns? Yes, ma'am, Miss Glover. I have a concern. Talk to me. My son walked. He was admitted to the hospital last night. Mm -hmm. And on the stairs, he was laying on the floor. And he was laying on the Okay. And give me your son's name one more time. Walter. Walter. Thank you. 
We'll make sure to keep him lifted up. You say he was admitted to the hospital last night? We'll make sure to keep him lifted up. We got you. Any other joys and concerns? Yes, ma'am, Miss Susie, how you doing? Mm -hmm. What was it? Hey, that's what the that's what the body parts are. Hey, well, we're glad to have you, Miss Susan. Glad it's good to see you. Um, she had joined us last week for worship. Me and Miss Rochelle have kind of been loving on her in a kind of special way. So it's good to see you, and it's good to see your granddaughter this morning. Yes, yes. So we'll continue to lift you both up in prayer as well. Yeah. Any other joys and concerns? Yes, sir, Elder Stephen. Uh, just. Uh... Week, another family member had COVID, so I was going around just to remember everybody out there with the It seems to be making a, a, another go around, it seems. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we just need to probably keep the whole country in prayer because everybody everywhere seems to be getting it again. It's no longer flu season, it's COVID season. COVID season. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all in here says no longer flu season, it's COVID season. I need that to die real quick. It probably ain't. They say it's going to be around this level. Yeah. So we're just going to keep praying that everyone gets better and gets through that journey. Um, any other joys? Yes, ma'am, Ms. Rita. Um, I had a, a beloved member of our neighborhood mm -hmm. where I grew up. Mm -hmm. Passed away this week. Oh. A lot of people knew her. Her name was Winnie Wallace, and she was 96 years old. Winnie Wallace? Waller. Waller. She lived a long, good life, and all the kids in the neighborhood thought she was their second mom. And so oh. she was very beloved by many here in Warlock. I went to the visitation on uh, Friday, and it was tremendous. So she was very loved, and she'll be missed. We need Waller. We'll make sure to keep her family lifted in prayer. We got you. Any other joys or concerns? I already said it, but I'm going to say it again. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Good to meet you, God, dog. That's okay. Now, say it twice now, so I got to make sure I address you, too. I can't. I see you uh, right past this, Marianne. I spoke to you this morning. I will speak to you again after church. It's good to see you. We're glad to have you. Blame her. I didn't do it. She did it twice. So I'm just adding a third time. But the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes, ma'am. What you got for us? I have an unspoken um, prayer request. You got you. Um, God knows what it is. He knows who's it, who it's for. But I've been trying to get um, somebody to come to church, and I feel like I'm getting closer, but I, I feel like I need to enlist. Let's help your family. Yeah. yeah. We got we, you. We need some prayer warriors. Okay. It's, it's, it's coming very close for them to come. Okay. I'm not. <clears throat> okay. Understood. We'll we'll make sure to lift that up in prayer. We'll lift that concern up. Anything? Yes, Cliff. What you got, Cliff? Yes. Yeah. Uh, All right, I got you. Let me keep you lifted, man. We got you. I think I saw another hand. They just be saying things. All right, got it. If nothing else, let us lift these things up in prayer. Let us pray. Most gracious and holy Father, we lift up each and every individual to you this day. God, we start off with. Walter, God, we ask that you continue to watch over him and keep him. That, Lord, you will bless us to keep him this long, to see him through pain, through therapies, through different things he had to go through in life. So, Lord, we know just as you've kept him then, that you can keep him now. God, we ask you to continue to bless us to Susie and her granddaughter. We thank you for allowing them to come back to worship with us again. Yeah. We thank you for keeping them even in these times of their dealing with their own things trying to walk this journey the best that they can. We ask God that you watch over those with COVID, where it seems to be coming through again and hitting many of our beloved ones. So continue to be with them. Lord, watch over the Waller family, as they have just lost truly a pinnacle of the heart of that family and of this community. We ask God that, that you heal in only the way that you can. Lord, we ask that you watch over this friend that Jessica is praying about. That Lord, we come together as a community praying that you touch the heart of this individual so that they can see your love, so that they can see your grace, and they can be continuously filled with your mercy. We ask God to continue to watch over Cliff, because each of us have had moments that we can call stupid, that we can call low, but Lord, your grace and mercy allows us to see a day that we can still have redemption. We thank you, God, for all that you're doing in every person's life in this building. 
And Lord, there are many things that we're going through that we still don't know how to talk about. So God, even those things, we lift up to you on this day. God, we ask that you watch over the church as we continue to try to be a church that looks like your kingdom. That is not ruled by one man, but is only ruled by your spirit. So God, we ask that you watch over us, keep us, and bless us. In the mighty name of Jesus, we do pray. Let every heart say, Amen. We come to the communion hymn, which is 562, verses 1 and 3, because he lives. in remembrance of him. Sometimes when I'm out talking to people, they, they ask, why do you all do this every Sunday? Because one, we believe in scripture, but we also believe that this is a form of worship, that this is a moment that as a community and as a body of believers, we focus on a practice that Christ did with his disciples. And if there's anything that Christians should do, we should be always seeking to be more like Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so in this practice, we do it weekly because we understand that at this table is where Christ accepted us. Yeah. At this table is where Christ loved us. And that no matter what we had done in the past, he still said, come my son, and he still said, come my daughter. He said, no matter what you've done, this table is still open to each and every one of us. And if some of us are honest with ourselves, we truly sometimes say, I really don't deserve the amount of love that Christ gives, but his mercy endures forever. And that gave us the mercy to still come before this table. Amen? Amen. We understand that as he was with his disciples on that faithful night, that he showed them two practices, mainly three. The first one being how to be a servant. But when they walked in, no one chose to be a servant. So he put on a servant's ideal in practice, took on water and washed each of his disciples' feet. 
Church, we can never lose our servant heart trying to do things to look cute. If our Savior can choose to wash the feet of his creation, we have to make sure we don't get so big in ourselves that we can't do the simple task of Christ. Yes. But not only did he do that, he showed us also that things are coming because he knew that crucifixion was on the way. He knew imprisonment was on the way. He understood the weight that was coming onto him. And I believe, especially now more than ever in our country and in our world, that Christ is saying, be mindful of what you see. Be mindful of what you do because it has an impact both in the physical and the spiritual that sometimes we're not ready to always prepare for. But then not only that, he showed him the practice because he did as he did throughout his ministry. First, he took the bread. He said, this is my body, a representation of my body that I give for each and every one of you. As he did throughout his ministry, first, he took the bread. He blessed it. He broke it. And then he gave it out to each of his disciples to take. Then he took the wine saying that this is a representation of my shed blood that I give so that you can have relationship with God. That we don't need priests, but instead it is a one-on-one -on -one relationship that when we need to pray, we can do it in our homes, we can do it in our cars, we can do it in our bathrooms. This blood was the reconnecting of us to God. He said, this is my blood. And so he said, take and drink, and he gave it to each and every one of them. Before we continue, we'll have a quick moment of prayer and we'll pass out the elements. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your Son, Jesus, for that gift that is there for us to all partake. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for creating this table so long ago, a table that if we approach it correctly, can lift the burden of sin off our shoulders. Yes. And Lord, we just thank you for never leaving us, for walking with us each and every day, for strengthening us, for encouraging us. And just giving us the way ahead, the path ahead. And Lord, we just thank you for it's in your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, if you'd please come forward, get the elements, and then turn to your seats, and we'll take them in unison. back to their seats. Um, we understand that after Christ's crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension, that the first century church came together to do this practice. The issue was that when they came together, they didn't always come with the right meaning of heart and mind. The Apostle Paul showed in his time that before you take of this sacred practice, that there has to be time that you push everything else aside, that we as Christians try to put our best foot forward to focus on true communion with God. And I believe that before we take this moment, that we all can have about five to six seconds where we focus in on Christ, where we tune all the troubles of life, all the struggles of life out of the way, and just say, Lord, with you I live. So let us take this time to do that now. Yeah. 
Amen. First, he took the bread, saying that this is a representation of his body. So take and eat. Next, he took the wine, saying that this is a representation of his shed blood. Take and drink. Just as Christ is given to us, we believe in giving back to him. We've come to that time of giving. Um, yesterday was a great example of what we do when we come together as a family. I believe that as we continue to sow into the table, that God will continue to bring forth more fruit, continue to bring forth more souls, and show us how to be the church for this community. So we thank you for your support, and we thank you for walking along this journey with us. Amen? Amen. Amen. We thank you. excited to be with you all. Today's message is interesting and I almost may have to teach it after I finish uh, <laughs> preaching about it. So somebody, one, please pray for me. First of all, I want to say thank you all for coming to church. Second, we've been going through this series called Building the Living Church. That's the theme for the year. And the series is Being the Church. So we've been walking through the book of Acts, chapter by chapter, even verse by verse. We've come to chapter 16. A specific verse I want us to focus in on before we look at the whole area, which is 16 to 24. In Acts 16, let's look at verse 18. When you got it, say amen. If you need a minute, say hold on. Hold on. I got you. Acts 16. <laughs> verse 18. Amen. Give it about a couple more seconds. Amen. And it reads, And she did this for many days, but Paul was greatly aggravated, and turning to the Spirit, said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and it came out right away. Most gracious and holy Father, may this word be used to glorify your name and transform our very lives. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. The title for today's message is Doing Ministry Aggravated. Let the church say, Doing Ministry? Doing Ministry? Aggravated. Aggravated. As we've walked through Acts, we've seen very few moments where the apostles, the disciples, the people of God have been aggravated while doing ministry. 
The most easiest idea that we can give is when Peter was lied to when he told the people to sell all they own and to bring the money back so they can help the poor. But before that and after that, we haven't seen the term aggravated used by the people of God in this sense. So we understand in the beginning of chapter 16 that Paul and Silas were first about to go to the continent of Asia, but the Spirit told them no and gave them instead to go to Macedonia. They met a lady by the name of Lydia and gave her the true gospel and then converted her to the fullness of Christianity. But now we find ourselves in a city known as Philippi or Philippi, I've heard both translations, that Paul and Silas are walking around and the Bible says that there was a girl who had a spirit of prediction who followed them around screaming for several days, these are men of God, that if you listen to them that you shall have true salvation. And she did this for days upon days upon days. The Bible then says that Paul became aggravated, turned to the spirit, and then banished it out of her. But then the next thing the Bible says is that she went back to her masters and they saw that they could not get any more money out of her. So they went and took Paul and Silas to prison. But even before that, beating them, flogging them, and then sending them to the magistrate, to the police officers, and then put them in prison. Church, I have a couple of issues with this text today. The first issue I had was why did he wait for so many days? Because you noticed that she had done this one day, and then for days upon days upon days in, she kept doing it. And it got to the point of aggravation. Personally, in my personal experience, I was like, well, Lord, why did he do this? And sometimes when talking to God, he'll be like, well, why did you do it? I said, what do you mean? Well, why often in this Christian walk, when we deal with people, we see an issue, but we don't always handle it immediately. We sometimes see a burden, we sometimes see a struggle, and we let it go on for days upon days upon days. But then the other issue is that when we finally choose to handle the issue, we handle it in an aggravated state, in an annoyed state, and sometimes we say it in the worst way possible. We do what's called the right thing, but the way we do that right thing matters. I was like, well, God, that's true. I said, I have to be someone who has to be honest with myself that sometimes we see people who struggle with certain issues and infirmities and we allow it to settle. We say, well, that's just how they've always been. Well, it's okay, that's just mama them. It's, uh, we, we make it okay, we make excuses for it. But then I had to understand that that wasn't the case of what's happening here. Do we understand that when a spirit comes before the presence of those who have God in them, that it has to submit to the God in them. I want to I build that case real quick. So understand that we saw throughout the Gospels that when Jesus Christ was doing his ministry, that when a spirit that had taken hold of a person came, that when Jesus came by, that spirit had to bow down to Christ. Mark 3.11, it says the demons fall down before Jesus Christ and cry out, you are the son of God. Mark 5, 6 and 7, a man possessed by a demon runs and worships Jesus from a distance, crying out, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High? So we see that when they come in the presence of those who even represent God, that truth has to come out of even an unclean spirit. Church, does that mean that when people see us that we know have unclean spirits, that sometimes they either one tell the truth about us or truly say nothing about us at all? which often can be very telling. But then I wondered, why then did it happen over and over and over again? So then I had to look at what that word grieve aggravated meant from Paul's perspective, because I thought that it meant that he was upset with the girl. But in actuality, he was upset with the spirit that was forcing the girl to proclaim God's name. Understand that God does not need help from evil spirits. That if anyone should stand for the worship of God, it should be God's own people. 
So when Paul saw this, he became aggravated by the spirit, forcing this girl to continue to do this day in and day out. Church, at what point do we become so frustrated, so angry that we do something about these spirits? Because I believe in each and every one of our lives, we've had to deal with one kind of spirit or another. But the question comes, how, how aggravated do we have to be then to do ministry in an aggravated state? How mad must I become before I do something about what's already wrong? How much of my community and of our families and of our friend groups has to die before we do what we already should have been doing? Because Paul did the right thing. He banished out the spirit. I believe that's something that we have to do in some of our friend groups and in some of our families, that there are spirits that we've allowed to harbor around us who have no business being around us. And when the church chooses to stop waiting to be aggravated, and chooses to banish out those things that are harming the church. Because we do understand that just like water and oil can't mix, evil and good can't either. So how often we sit in church and just make excuses for those things that we know are evil? I don't know why, but I said that for a second. How often are we going to sit around in church? And that that's not just for the table. That's for all the churches universal. How often are we going to sit around in church? and allow evil to be comfortable in church. How often do we have to sit there and make excuses for our families, for our friends, and for our loved ones, knowing that behavior has a spirit that can latch on to us if we stay around it too long? And then there becomes a fight in us internally because the spirit of God that is ruled in us is now fighting what we've allowed around us. Yes. Amen. So how often and how long do we have to wait? before we do something about it. But the, the bigger issue that I had was not with what Paul did waiting, not with his aggravated state of ministry, but the bigger issue I had is that people aren't always prepared for what happens after the spirit is gone. Because we see what happened in the text. The text says that after the spirit is gone, the, the men who owned this woman found her and saw that she could no longer do what she used to be able to do. Do we understand that if we remove some spirits from some people and even from ourselves, there are things that people used to be able to do to you, they won't be able to do yes. no more. Amen. Things that used to aggravate you, things that used to frustrate you, things that would put you in a submissive state, not correctly by God, but instead by psychological torture. They can't do it anymore. Why? Because the spirit has been removed from you. How many people need to be freed and the church is the method that's supposed to free them. But the church sits around and does nothing. Do we understand that there are people who are being used for what they can be used for? And we sit around doing nothing. If truth be told, what is that personal thing that you and I see? That's either one in our own personal lives or two in the people that are surrounding us that we as people of God should have already handled a long time ago. But we waited, we kept watching, we kept, well, they have good days, but how often is this bad day? Well, they have good moments, but how often are you crying? Well, I did good today, but I've been doing bad all week. At what point do we change the narrative and change the pattern? Because at some point, the evil spirits cannot rule the church because the church still belongs to the Lord. So we can't keep waiting until we get aggravated to do the right thing then. God is showing us that if we're not careful, that we'll let people say the right thing to us, but not have the right thing in their hearts. Yes. And then when they are finally freed, it now creates an issue that you have to deal with next. What happened after they freed the girl? She was captured then again by her masters, saw that she was unable to do what she had been making them money to do. And then they went and found them, beat, flogged, bruised, and then took them to prison. Because now you have messed up the economic structure of our city because I was making money off of this girl and you've messed that up. 
How often have we seen people you who said when the church shows them how to be free, somebody mad? Mm. Amen. Amen. <laughs> how often have we showed people the greater light of who God is in their life, and then they change over a new leaf? They talk better. They walk better. They move better. They live better, and somebody gets angry. In in my few simple thirty years of living, I've become okay with people being angry at me for doing God's work. Yes, I sleep so much better at night because I became content with doing it His way, rather than trying to make people okay with me. Yes, and church, we have to come to the point of being centered on God that is more important to do it His way. That brings life, that brings peace, that brings joy, that brings yes. things that the world cannot bring to the life of His believers. Just don't have time to wait. <clears throat> Too much is going on in our world and in our country for the church to continue to wait for somebody else to handle what the church is already supposed to be doing. And I mean God's way, not any type of geopolitical way, not any type of social productive way. I just simply mean God's way. Because the truth be told, as we've talked about for months before, people have used the name of God the wrong way. And now I'm talking to the table specifically. If anything about this house will be true, we're going to do it God's way. Amen? Amen. That means past politicals, past racial groups, past social groups, past class groups. We shall do it God's way. Yes. Because we do not have time to be aggravated doing ministry. There should be a joy in it. And when we see people who are stuck like this woman was, that we do something immediately. So that the spirit doesn't have to harm her anymore. We see what happened to them that they were thrown in prison. They were not just thrown in prison. They were thrown on the internal part of the prison. Which means they had guards and gates and guards and gates. The most frustrating thing for any of us as Christians is when we do the right thing. We're trying our best to do the right thing. Yet evil still somehow seems to prevail. That somehow I'm still worse off and they're still better. It is a frustrating thing. But I believe wholeheartedly that God has us in prison-like situations for a reason. That God has us sometimes locked up and sometimes restrained for a reason. Is it the possibility that we didn't know humility until we were put in prison situations? Is it the possibility that we couldn't see God until God took certain things from us? Is it the possibility that God is removing friends and family? Because it, it can happen sometimes. That he'll remove friends and family from you just so we can get back on track with him. Yes. There's a direction he's trying to take us. And sometimes, if truth be told, we're hard headed. Yes, <laughs> and we don't want to do it his way. So he'll watch the building fall until we're ready mm -hmm. to submit. Yes. I have to do what God told me to do, and I have to make sure I stop here because next week we deal with the prison. We deal with being stuck in a dark place when you're doing the right thing, and God simply says, this is where you're supposed to be. So as you have this week to yourselves, understand, find the places that you're aggravated. Find the things that you've held off doing. Find the ministry that should have been done years ago that needs to be done today. Find that part of God in your local community or in your home that says, Lord, you need to be here more now than ever before. Find that place, and even in our homes, that a prayer life needs to be added back in. That a time of reading scripture and meditation needs to be added back in. So that we can truly hear God and see God for all that he is in our individual lives. So as we prepare to do the invitation song, I simply say this to each and every one of us. There's a part that we've all pushed to the side. There's a part that we all haven't given the true attention that is needed. But God is saying, from today moving forward, you know better. You've been called out to do something. And at this point, the blood is on our hands if we don't do the will of God. That's not to be scary, that's to be honest. Because we sit around too many times trying to sugarcoat God's word. The truth is, the truth needs to be said. And there are things that need to break in our houses. And then true Holy Spirit will come in. 
true love can come in. True hope can come in. And that as we choose to abide in his will and in his word, that there should be a newness of life for each and every one of us. I promise you this much that I've seen it happen a few times in my life. That those moments where I was aggravated, I choose, chose to do it God's way. And the benefit that came was greater than anything I could have concocted and put together. Standing with me all over the room. Please stay. Say this now, let them say. Where are you aggravated in life? Are you aggravated because you haven't done what God told you to do? Are you aggravated because the ministry that's in you, you've kind of held off on? And then you're coming to God, frustrated, angry. He's like, this is your fault. We like to blame God for the stuff we can do when he already told us what to do. So as we worship together, I simply say this. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you may come forward as we sing. If you don't have a church home, we would love to have you here at the table. Because truly, as our motto says, we love God and we love people. And we're always going to be about God's business. But lastly, if this week has just been a lot for you to deal with, and you just need time in this altar to pray, the altar is open for you as well. So as we say, um, if you don't know Christ, you may come. If you don't have a church home, you may come. And if you just need prayer, you may come as well. Amen.
Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for allowing us to worship in your house in our own individual way. We ask God that you watch over each and every individual, both here and online, and that they have a great week, that they have a blessed week, and that they are still covered in your love, grace, and mercy. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. Let all hearts say, Amen. Amen.